everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Happy New Year and welcome to Arts in the City. First up, seltzer men used to be as common as milkmen delivering seltzer right to your door. But now there is only one old school seltzer bottler left in New York. Our Andrew Falzone popped in to check out the bubbly business. Every time Alex Gomberg opens the doors to Brooklyn Seltzer Boys in Cypress Hills, Brooklyn, he's not only continuing the third generation of a family business, he's preserving a New York City tradition. You see, once upon a time, seltzer factories like his were common in the city, but just like visits from the milkman, most seltzer deliveries faded away. So our family uh, got started into the business, I would believe in the late 40s, early 50s. My great-grandfather started Gomberg Seltzer Works, which was our family company in 1953. So seltzer men would have their own trucks and they would come to our Gomberg Seltzer Works and have their bottles filled. Now Brooklyn Seltzer Boys is the last seltzer filler in New York State, but the seltzer business here in Brooklyn is quite bubbly. Alex says Brooklyn Seltzer Boys has a roster of about 600 plus residential customers, some bars and restaurants, and a substantial wait list. So we're really going as far as we can go with our own trucks. Um, but there's just a point where it gets a little bit too far. That's because Brooklyn Seltzer is a two-way sale. Brooklyn Seltzer Boys comes in a reusable pressurized glass bottle. After each use, they're collected, washed out, and sent back out. Hand-blown in Czechoslovakia, some of them are over 100 years old, each bottle an antique vessel carrying a vintage product. A lot of the bottles have imprints uh, with the old logos of etchings of old seltzer men. Also with the name of the seltzer company on the top of the, on the head. You get a case delivered, there's 10 bottles in a case. You're picking up history every single time. While the bottle heads that shoot the seltzer are equally old, they are far more complicated to maintain. There's a lot of different springs and washers inside. Uh, the head's about 15 different pieces to the bottle. So it's not something that can be easily be made in the mold. There's a lot of working parts to it. And Alex's business has some other working parts as well. When the seltzer factory's delivery bays empty out, it reveals the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum, which is a collaboration between the Gomberg family and Barry Joseph, a part-time faculty member at NYU and the author of Seltzertopia, a 300-page love letter to its namesake. On display are some of the original machines that powered Gomberg Seltzer Works back in the 50s, and finally a walk on the factory floor, which takes visitors through the four-stage process of making seltzer. First, the water is triple filtered through sand, charcoal, and paper to remove any impurities and unwanted taste. The water then gets chilled between 32 and 42 degrees, which makes the next step, which is carbonation, more efficient. We then take it from the carbonator and bring it into our seltzer machine. And then these bottles, okay, we'll go one by one into the machine and one time around the bottles filled. That's when it's time for pickup and delivery. And during our visit, we were lucky enough to bump into a true seltzer legend. In fact, Walter Backerman may be the world's most famous seltzer man. Not only is he memorialized in the Brooklyn Seltzer Museum, but he's told his story to the New York Times, NPR, and even Japan's NHK TV. For him, seltzer has literally been a lifelong career. And as my father rang doorbells looking for new customers, my mother pushed me in the baby buggy, and that's my first day on the route, wow. and that's over 70 years ago. And it's safe to say that some of those same bottles that you were pushing around that right. day are right here. Well, I wasn't pushing them then, but now sure. I am. <laughs> now I am. Uh -huh. so look at it. Look at these beautiful bottles. Yeah. Beautiful. It works a lot. First, we're going to take Fox. Before we parted ways, Alex offered to share the technique and nuance of making perhaps the best sweet treat one can with seltzer, a proper Brooklyn egg cream. It starts with classic You Bet syrup in your favorite flavor, but chocolate is tradition, some ice cold milk, and of course, Brooklyn seltzer. But it's not as simple as mix and stir. So the trick is you want to take a spoon, like a long spoon, and you want to deflect the seltzer off of the spoon. And what you want to do is you want to create this nice, white, foamy, frothy head on top. Okay. Okay, we're not going to mix until the seltzer is in there. So 
Now we're gonna mix it. And the best egg cream is gonna be darkest on the bottom and lightest on the top. Then just add a candy striped straw for nostalgia and sipping. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. That is good. It's good, right? That is amazing. At a time when daily headlines detail hate-fueled violence, an inspiring new exhibit in Lower Manhattan spotlights the depth of human compassion. Our next stop, the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It was the right thing to do, so we did it. A seemingly simple principle that saved thousands of lives. A new exhibition at the Museum of Jewish Heritage explores the awe-inspiring story of neighbors standing together to rescue Denmark's Jewish population in 1943. Project director and curator Ellen Berry explains this heroism was sparked when word of an imminent deportation spread through the community. From that moment on, the most incredible story of rescue and escape began in October of 1943, in which Jews and Danes worked together to ferry to safety almost 95% of the Jewish population of Denmark to Sweden in small boats from kayaks to fishing boats to lighthouse tenders to rowboats, one boat at a time, not more than 10 or 15 people per boat. So do the calculation. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of missions in the cover of darkness in a clandestine operation. The exhibit, called Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, details this remarkable chapter of history through photos, archival materials, testimonials, artifacts, and storytelling, including hologram-like technology that brings the past to life. It is the museum's first exhibition for children, designed for ages nine and up, with a message of tolerance and moral certainty that could not be more timely. I feel that it's incredibly important, especially for our younger visitors, to be reminded that even in the darkest times, there are always good people. And there are always ways to make moral decisions and stand up for what's right. There are many gripping stories here. For example, that of the Gerda Three, a small boat used to carry supplies that saved an estimated 300 lives. But perhaps most breathtaking is the sense of collective effort, people working together and individually, risking their own safety to save the lives of fellow residents. You hear about people offering keys to strangers so they could hide in their homes. Um, doctors, the whole medical community, rose up and hid Jews in beds, wrote fake charts sent them in ambulances, in hearses. It's quite incredible. People said it was just the right thing to do, so we did it. The museum shared some fascinating behind-the-scenes interviews with us, including this one, a New York City teenager who has a deep connection to the character she portrays in the exhibition. My grandpa, during the Holocaust, escaped from Denmark to Sweden on rowboats and that's when he was 14 or 15. My father, Harold of Kohn, was a Danish Jew living in Copenhagen during the war, and he and his family escaped with the help of a fisherman, knowing that I'm here and my daughter's here and that she will continue the legacy of, of my dad and the Danish Jews it means the world to me. This extraordinary rescue story ends as it began with conviction and profound humanity. Another thing that is incredible about this story is that the Jews were welcomed back, and that was not the case in the rest of Europe. And not only were they welcomed back, but frequently their homes, their things, had been kept by their neighbors. The city of Copenhagen set up a place where things could be held. They were truly welcomed home. And you'll see we have an image in the exhibition, which is a large ferry, which shows people coming home, coming back, with a huge crowd waving them in. They were dressed up. It was, it was a celebration when they came home. A hub for Hollywood movie making for more than 100 years, 
in Queens. Neil Rosen stopped by Kaufman Astoria Studios for a tour of New York City's cinematic past, present, and future. There's a group of huge buildings that are situated in the heart of Astoria, Queens. There's a big sign in front that proudly says Kaufman Astoria Studios. So what exactly is this place? Well, it's a landmark movie studio with an illustrious history that's unlike any other in all of New York. This is the main stage of Kaufman Astoria Studios. It's huge, and it's one of the largest sound stages in the country. It was built over 100 years ago, and many classic films from the silent era all the way up to the present that many of you are probably very familiar with were shot right where I'm standing. Construction of the facility began in 1918, before movies even had sound. During its early heyday in the 20s and 30s, it was often referred to as Paramount Pictures East. You see, air travel was not readily available back then. Getting to Hollywood was a several day ordeal, and the biggest stars of the day, like the Marx Brothers for example, were right here in New York, performing their hit comedies Coconuts and Animal Crackers on Broadway stages at night. But during the day, they would hop on over to Astoria Studios and film movie versions of those very same plays. Oh, so that's your game, is it? Well, you can't shut me up. So why build this massive studio in Astoria? Hal Rosenbluth, the president of Kaufman Astoria, explains. What a lot of people don't understand is the George Washington Bridge didn't exist, which where they were doing stuff in Fort Lee. The bridge that existed was the 59th Street Bridge or the Queensboro Bridge, now the Ed Koch Bridge, right? That bridge existed. So to travel over to Queens was a whole lot easier than having to get in a ferry and go over to Fort Lee where there was other production going on back in those days. And land was cheaper out here. Movie legends like Rudolph Valentino, Gloria Swanson, W.C. Fields and Burns and Allen, just to name a few, all made very successful films here back in those days. There was even a Hollywood style outdoor back lot on the property. Paramount left in the late 30s, but the facility didn't remain dormant as the U.S. Military Film Division took over and the back lot became the space for Army barracks. And by 42, it became the Army Pictorial Center, so that every moving image that was seen by the armed services from 42 to 1970 was either done here or controlled out of here. Training films, propaganda films, all done here. When the Army left in 1970, the studio was empty and fell into disrepair. The place was reborn and renovated in 1978 with the movie The Wiz, starring Diana Ross and Michael Jackson, bringing film and TV production back to the city and rejuvenating the neighborhood of Astoria. Since then, literally hundreds of noteworthy films, many of them Oscar winners, have been filmed here on the main stage. For example, Kaufman Astoria Studios has been home to the Tom Hanks movie The Money Pit. I just want to relax in a nice, lukewarm bath. There was Al Pacino's Glen Gary, Glen Ross, and Scent of a Woman. Whew. Many of Woody Allen films, like Broadway Danny Rose and the Purple Rose of Cairo, were shot here. And so was Cher and Nicolas Cage in Moonstruck. Snap out of it! Harrison Ford shot here in Sabrina, Will Smith did Men in Black 3, and Matt Damon's Bourne films, just to name a few, as the list is endless, were also shot at Kaufman Astoria Studios. Emmy award-winning TV shows like Orange is the New Black and Succession have also taken up residence here. And since the 70s, 11 additional state-of-the-art studios have been built on the property. One stage has housed Sesame Street for decades. The Cosby Show was filmed here, as well as Edie Falco's Nurse Jackie. Also on the premises are fully functioning carpentry shops, where all the various elaborate sets are built. Even the studio commissary, where the actors dined between shooting in the 1920s still exists today as a full-functioning Italian restaurant. It's called Saks Place and it's open to the public. And with only a few minor alterations, it looks pretty much the same way it did 100 years ago. When you add up everything the studio has to offer, it's New York's premier production facility. On the main stage of the extremely historic Kaufman Astoria Studios, where as I mentioned earlier, hundreds of classic films have been shot. I'm Neil Rosen for Arts in the City. Harpist Ashley Jackson has performed in New York and around the world. She's also an assistant professor in the music department at Hunter College and graciously gave our Donna Hanover an introductory lesson on the harp.
Ashley Jackson's harp playing is ethereal and vibrant, and it cuts across musical genres. I've been playing the music of Bach, of Beethoven, um, from a very early age. So they're as much a part of my DNA as the gospel music that I listen to at church on Sundays, or as the jazz that my dad would play me, or the soul music that I still listen to. So all of that gets mixed in and influences what I do. Ashley is a classically trained harpist whose work also celebrates African-American contributions to American music. One of her favorite spirituals is Take Me to the Water. She remembers her mom playing it as the organist at church. It's a baptism, spirituals. I think about that sense of renewal, of being reborn, of a brighter future. It's also a piece in her repertoire with the Harlem Chamber Players, where she's been a member for the last decade. She's soloed with them often, as when they did Alice Coltrane's Prima for Harp and Strings, recorded by WQXR for a Juneteenth celebration. Playing with the Harlem Chamber Players is like being home. They're my musical family. Ashley grew up in New Jersey along with her two sisters. She started playing harp at the age of seven because her piano teacher's niece gave lessons. Ashley got a BA at Yale, a master's at Yale School of Music, and a doctor of musical arts at Juilliard. She's performed around the world, soloed at Lincoln Center, and played with the New York Philharmonic. She's also an assistant professor in the Department of Music at Hunter College. And she's very patient with beginners. We've got 47 strings, and they are luckily color-coded for us. So all of the red strings that you see are C, so I'm having you play middle C. Uh, all the blue strings are Fs, and then it's laid out like the white keys of a piano. <laughs> Oops. Right, and the thumb's gonna make the sound towards the column, so you're gonna pluck this way. Oh, right. okay, let me do it again. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, but pluck that way. Right, and then after you pluck, Come all the way in. Okay. Come all the way into your palm. Yeah! <laughs> and don't, I said, don't be afraid to plug loudly. Ashley recently released her debut album. My first album is called Ananga, and it's the name of a piece by William Grant Still uh, for harp, string quartet, and double bass, as well as piano. And Ananga is the name of an African harp. One of the spirituals Ashley often plays is Deep River. I'm thinking about just the role that rivers and water played for my ancestors, that they were a place of refuge, a place where they might be able to escape um, enslavement. I'm playing an arrangement by the Afro-British composer, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He arranged it for our solo piano, and then I transcribed it for solo harp. It's one of the most recognizable melodies, I think, in American music. You can find Ashley's upcoming performances on her website. One highlight for your calendar, she'll perform with the Harlem Chamber Players for Black History Month at the Schomburg Center on February 15th. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. Before it became a worldwide sensation, swing dancing had its roots in Harlem. Susan Jun spoke to one organization trying to bring swing back to its original home. A few basic steps and these novice dancers are transformed into jitterbugs. Harkening back to the golden age of jazz in 1920s Harlem, where a type of swing dance called the Lindy Hop was born. Well, the Lindy Hop is a combination of the Texas Tommy, the Charleston, the two-step, and it was done to jazz music because jazz was really becoming popular starting in the late teens, early 20s. And that was the music of Harlem. 
music of a generation that fueled a fever of swing dance in the ballrooms of Harlem. Harlem had over 30 ballrooms of different sizes, which is amazing. So Harlem was like a city within a city, which in a way was good and in another way was bad. Um, downtown was the Roseland Ballroom and blacks weren't allowed. There was that prejudice thing going on. So when Harlemites had the Savoy Ballroom in 1926, they felt like it was theirs, even though technically it wasn't, but it felt like this is home. And it was a beautiful ballroom. There's pictures that still exist. And that's where the Lindy Hop happened. The, the um, ballroom was a block long on the second floor and it could fit over a thousand people. So um, you could just imagine people kicking their heels to hot jazz. Um, there were two bandstands, so it was continuous music. And the elders from the 1950s who were there, they tell us that they would walk out of there two, three in the morning. And to walk out in Harlem was, it was safe, it was fine. But when you see the footage of them dancing with their jackets on and the sweat and the, you know, that's how much they dance. This is an age before Facebook, before social media, TV. They love to dance. A legacy Barbara Jones sought to preserve and promote when she founded the Harlem Swing Dance Society in 2010. This dance is originated in Harlem became famous because of Harlem, but it's very little being done in Harlem. But the schools don't talk about it. It's not explained during, let's say, February Black History Month. The jazz and everything else in Harlem is discussed, but not the dance that made it famous. So Jones decided to flip the script by having her society bring swing to the community at street fairs, in schools, and at weekly lessons open to the public. To preserve a dance, you have to get people involved, especially the youth, so that it's passed on and they can develop it and um, make it their own. But we also want to preserve those memories. And generally when our seniors see it, you, you hear them talk about, oh, my mother went there. Something Tony Rogers grew up hearing and part of why he wants to pass on this rich local culture to the youth of Harlem. It's important because this is a dance that originated in Harlem, but for some reason they get lost. If you go to El Badio and they do salsa, if you go to the Caribbean, they do uh, soca. And I, I want to help allow for people to understand that there's a dance that originated in the community that everybody in the world does except for the people in the community. And it's evident this dance draws interest from afar. The Harlem Swing Dance Society came to Nashville and did a presentation. And it was when I first started dancing about a year and a half ago. And I found it really interesting. And then when I came here, I looked it up and here they were. The society also honors and collaborates with some of the great Harlem swing dancers still alive today. The oldest is 95 here in Harlem. But there's people like Sugar Sullivan, Barbara Billups, and Sonny Allen. A living culture that instructor Milo Seidel is proud to pass on. Just being here in Harlem, where Subway Ballroom is just a couple of blocks away, that's a great feeling. For more on all the Harlem Swing Dance Society has to offer, visit harlemswingdance.org. For Arts in the City, I'm Susan John. Next, we head to an exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum featuring art that inspires one of America's most influential and prolific filmmakers, Spike Lee. Carol Jenkins, host of CUNY TV's Black America, sat down with him. Joining me is none other than actor, screenwriter, director, and producer Spike Lee and Brooklyn boy, Spike Lee. Thank you. you. Thank you for having for me on your show. You are so welcome. It is such a pleasure. Audra, the producer, director, and I were just at the exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum mm -hmm. and bowled over by the expanse. It's, it's speaking to your creative sources. I, I, I use the word, my dear, I used to say pantheon. <laughs> the pantheon. Uh, whether it be sports, politics, photography, painting, cinema. Absolutely. And, and the influences being Brooklyn, basketball, music. 
That's in there too. The book was definitely uh, in the house, as they might I say. I know, but the collection of things, uh, and not only your family photographs, mm -hmm. you know, which are just beautiful to see. Thank you. Uh, but also your collection of art, which I don't think I've been aware of. And, and Audrey and I were wondering, where does he keep all of this, you know, when it's not on exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum, but just such beautiful, beautiful things. Thank you very much. But the genesis of this is that when people come to my office, they'll be like, damn, Spike, yo, you need to, you need to put this in a museum. So, so it you happened. <laughs> so it happened. And the book that uh, we have it on the table here, it weighs about 100 pounds, <laughs> but just so beautiful artistically what you put in the book as well. And Thank you very Scenes much. from all of the films and mm. stories, vignettes about putting it together. Girl 6, for instance, the one that I starred in. Mm. No, but <laughs> You're the star. <laughs> right. You, you and Madonna. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Madonna and were in that movie. You know, that you took over the entire floor of uh, an office building to shoot. Lower the, Manhattan, yeah. You know, Lower Manhattan to shoot that. And so many of the other that you will see. So go to the museum. Get the book. It is an extraordinary history of filmmaking. Period. I would, Not you know. Let I me would. ask you a question. What was the one piece that that you saw in the exhibition that you said, like? Well, if there's more than one. We could. No, I love. Well, you know, I love Toni Morrison. You know, yeah, I so love the portrait of her by Tim Akimir. Yes, I love that. Uh, the Kahinda see, Wiley. I see right, that. right, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's that right. The Kahinda oh. Wiley. Mm. There were so many pieces. Though the the old baseball. Photographs right. uh, Jackie enlarged. Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Jackie, Jackie, right? You know, Brooklyn, so, one of Brooklyn's finest. So much there, uh, and in terms of the source and uh, the experiential room, so to speak, where you can see clips from some of the the, the films and dance along. Uh, so, it, were you doing the butt? I was not doing the butt dance. Audra <laughs> was. <so. laughs> Be sure to check out the Spike Lee Creative Sources at the Brooklyn Museum. It will be open until February 11th. A must-see. Uh, so much to be proud of, Spike. Uh, thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. That is our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.